Welcome back to the Sports Show with Woody and Les and everyone else. Let's go to the phone right now and bring in Andrew Brandt, ESPN NFL business analyst. He also writes for Monday Morning Quarterback. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you guys. All right, so Andrew, we're, uh, we're doing that rank the undefeated teams thing here, okay? After watching the Broncos last night, there are four undefeated teams left in the NFL. Rank them for us, will you? Yeah, it's a tough one, especially after watching last night my uh, <laughs> my ten years with the Packers. I'm gonna probably lose some bias here, but uh, I think right now you'd probably still have to put the Patriots at the top. They just seem to have that magic about them this year. They're moving the ball without difficulty, and the defense is stepping up. So I guess I would probably put those three AFC teams at the top. Pack, I'm sorry, Patriots, Broncos, Bengals, and then Packers, Panthers. Packers aren't undefeated anymore, Andrew. I hate to break it to you. I know, but I would take them over the Panthers. It's actually they play this week, so we'll see. Okay. Andrew, this would be, and, and, and I just got through saying a few moments ago, and I'd like to get your observation about the Packers since you're so closely allied to them. Yeah. But the the defense was a fraud last night, and, and I felt sorry for them. They lost two cornerbacks in the game. They already playing two young cornerbacks. They were playing safeties at cornerback. Their starting safety came. Sam Shields, their best cornerback, went out early in the game. Then uh, they they had their safety, one of the starting safeties, playing for the first time last night. Juice Peppers, we didn't hear a thing from him last night. And Clay Matthews Jr. even he was hurt in the middle of the game, but he really didn't dominate. And if I were the Packers, I'd be very, very concerned about that defense going forward. And the Vikings are just looming there, one game behind. Yeah, and they haven't played. I mean, I think all this gets down to when that sort of meaty part of the schedule comes in. Listen, if I looked at the Packers' schedule going in, uh, a Sunday nighter at the Broncos retiring Bolin or having yeah. a tribute to Bolin, and, you know, the, the the way that crowd, I've been there, and when I was with the Packers, that's a really tough place to play. I wouldn't mark that down as an L, and it's their only L. That defense you talked about has been interesting because they there was a stat that Al Michaels brought up last night. I think they're in the 20s in rank or in the 20s in yards, but they were first in points allowed. So they were allowing teams to sort of bend but don't break, come, to, come move the ball all the way down the field, and then not score, not get home, as they say. Well, the, the Broncos got home, and that was something they hadn't seen before. And, you know, again, we have to sort of, we're in a week-to-week -week league. Uh, we'll see what happens. If the Packers come out and beat up the, the Panthers next week, then we're but back. But that, that, that game's on the road, too, isn't it? Yeah, that'll and, be a tough one. And, and now the Packers have only played three road games, and everybody was just exclaiming about, Oh, that hard count. Well, when you play on the road, that hard count goes away. Uh, he tried one night, one time last night to hard count on a third and four or five, and and uh, nobody bid on that. Uh, so it doesn't yeah. work on the road like it does at home. And they still got a majority of their games on the road and, and going to Carolina. And, and I would say offensively, we saw the defensive template against everybody talking about, oh, here's how you're going to defend Peyton Manning. Well, the way I was just telling Les that what was interesting to me last night is that Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware ran upfield. They didn't run at, Peyton, at, at Aaron Rodgers, and they kept him in the pocket. He throws great on the run. Uh, offensively, yeah. you have to be concerned. Lacey is fat. He didn't run well. Uh, the, the wide receivers never got open, and the offensive line wasn't very good. Yeah, it was really a well-done performance by the Broncos. But again, I'd like to see where this goes because, again, you've got the Packers that have two games left against Detroit. You can kind of chalk those up. And it comes down to where, where are teams going to be late in the season? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Are they coming over injuries with guys getting back? Those kind of things. And again, I talked about the top three teams I would rank now in the AFC. I just don't see it in the NFC. I don't trust Seattle with that offense. That They have trouble yeah. Scoring, they have trouble scoring points, and I hate to say it, I don't really trust Arizona yet. Uh, so it's Packers, Panthers. Obviously, the Romo injury, they may be too far out of it by the time he gets back. Hey. So who are you going to trust in the a NFC? And then, of course, the AFC. We'll see. We see the Patriots and the Broncos playing later. Well. The Bengals, no one's going to trust them until they get to January. We'll see. 
And, and, Andrew, uh, and, and you left out, though, Carolina. I mean, the team. Yeah. We'll find out, I think, a lot more about the Packers in Carolina next week. Yeah, uh, we Andrew, the landscape could change considerably uh, with the trade deadline tomorrow. Before we get into any possible trades, I, I want to ask you, as somebody who worked in a front office for so many years in Green Bay, why is there so little activity at the NFL trade deadline relative to baseball, basketball, hockey deadlines? Yeah, and it's exactly what I wrote a memo and a proposal presented by the Packers uh, to the league to have a little more acceptability to trading. Two things. One, moving the deadline back, which they actually have done, but it's only two weeks back compared to what we were proposing about four weeks back to make it in mid-November as sort of like a baseball home stretch. And the answer we got from the league was, well, you know, you make your bed, you live in it. You don't we don't want to be baseball. We don't want to rent a player for six weeks for the stretch run. They didn't want to do that. The other part of it was, and I understand this is kind of novel, I said, why don't we allow teams to trade cap room for players? Because sometimes you have these teams with all this backed-up cap room, and there's no one to get on the street with all that cap room because all the good players are signed. So trade cap room. Trade a team that needs players that has a lot of cap room. And, of course, they kind of laughed at me about that, too. It's just too novel, too innovative, too progressive for what they were thinking. Yeah, there it, is no buzz. Yeah, There's nothing about trades. And I think one reason, if I could finish about it, is that the football schematic, it's not baseball where you can plug in a pitcher, plug in a catcher, plug in a hitter, or even basketball. It's schematic and a 4-3 and 3-4 and cover 2 and cover 3 and that tends to be the reason you don't see a lot of trade. Well, I, I wasn't really trying to interrupt you because I think that's yeah. incredible stuff that I I think, Andrew, that that they laughed at uh, Eli Whitney when he came up with the idea for cotton gin and we <laughs> saw how that worked out, but I think you're absolutely right that if you took the Oakland Raiders now, the Oakland Raiders are close to the minimum cap area. Right. They've been trying to clear cap room for years and years. And the Oakland Raiders are a legitimate team. If the Oakland Raiders could trade, as you say, some cap room and get some players, they could make a run here at a wild card spot in the AFC. Well, if the season ended today, they, they would be the fifth seed in the AFC. That's why, that's yeah. why I'm saying I, I think, Andrew, you're right. that I, I hate to see where baseball where you rent a player for the last – month or so and even they get guys that they can't even play in the playoffs so i don't like that design as much but i i like that the trading deadline was pushed back and i liked it if there's a way to create more room so that if you're you're an oakland raiders you can clear you know the cap is it possible andrew that the cap could kind of be flexibleized is that a word? Obviously not, but flexible well, I, I think, yeah, what you bring up is it, what I suggested, which is the cap room may not help you in 2015 because you only got a few games left. You're not going to get anyone off the street again. But you can carry over cap room. So say you trade a player and you give up $10 million of cap room. You're not going to use it this year. But you carry it into next year. You have a big number to go chase free agents and improve your team next year. That's value. That's value. So teams are always talking, talking about how do we get value for this player, and sometimes you even hear about what I call the ham sandwich trades where you get a seventh-round pick in 2020 just to say you got something. But instead of that, what if the team gave you, you know, $700,000 of cap room? That's no skin off their back if they have $30 million of cap room. So those are ways I think you could be a little more flexible. But given the conditions that exist right now, do you think because there's so many bad teams and that they're, the league is top-heavy with fewer teams than normal? You know, over the years, that was a P. Roselle. You know this. P. Roselle wanted virtual parity. Yeah. Every team a date. Well, this year we're seeing that there are eight teams that are good and there are ten teams that are awful. I mean, is that going to generate more trading tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow because of that? Or you know, less. My experience is always the same these three days between Sunday night and Tuesday afternoon. A lot of smoke, a little fire. Everyone talks, and but the smart GMs are always asking the same question. Why are you getting rid of this guy? You know, you tell me he's a good player. 
you tell me I could use them, why, do you, why don't you want them? And it tends to be their contract, <laughs> attitude, character, some issue they don't want the player, and everyone backs off. I think there'll be some trades, but there'll be no trades that you care about. I mean, backup players that need a shot somewhere else or a little bit of a, one of these ham sandwich trading a guy, you don't have to cut him, get a, get a seventh-round pick in a couple of years. I just don't see any big names out there being traded. Hey, Except hey, last hey, that, Andrew, hey. the Patriots always dabble. Yeah, they do make trades. They're the ones who hey, dabble hey, at An this time. Andrew, in 2006, you signed a pretty good player named Charles Woodson in Green Bay. Almost 10 years later, he leads the NFL in interceptions with five at 39 years old. Could you have ever imagined that happening? One of my favorites, uh, we chase this guy, and as you know about the Packers, maybe the last team in the league to chase free agents. But we looked around after a week, and our, our motto was, let's keep our hands in our pockets for a week, let all the money be spent, and see what's out there. And he was there. And we're looking at each other like, wait a minute, Charles Woodson? Nobody's running him. That was our word, running. And everyone says, well, no one's, why? And we sort of research it. Oh, he's too old. <laughs> <laughs> 2006, too old. He'd been in the league eight years, 29 years old. And we're looking around like, really, too old? A corner? He's great shape. And uh, I got to tell you, even with one of being basically the only team offering by far the most money, it was quite a sell. <laughs> I had to tell him. I felt like the Green Bay Chamber of Commerce trying to sell him on yeah. Green Bay. Well, and paid and basically back. told him it was going to be like yeah. Ann Arbor, and yeah. we made it happen. That was ten years ago almost. Uh, and and I grew up in Tennessee, and people in Tennessee are still bitter about Woodson beating out Peyton for the Heisman Trophy. Right, and, I remember and, that. and then Woodson comes back out and, and embarrasses him again with two interceptions in the Raiders game. So Woodson <laughs> and Woodson's talking about. Playing again next year. So. He and Peyton and a former client of mine, I was an agent before team, Matt Hasselbeck. Those are the three players yeah. in the 1998 draft. And, and Hasselbeck played extremely well. When, I mean, he played well enough that he actually played better than Andrew Luck has played this year. Still going strong, Matt. Yeah. Andrew, I always love having you on. Really appreciate your time. Um, give everybody your Twitter handle, okay? Well, I, I've changed. <laughs> I've got my name. I found it. Andrew Brandt. <laughs> you did you have, Andy Brandt, but now I'm Did Andrew you have Brandt to pay for it? I had to pay for mine. <laughs> no, someone told me I could do it. They just did it for me, basically. Yeah. Well, Andrew, love your stuff. We read you on ESPN all the time, and we'll, uh, we'll follow you on Twitter as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. All right, Andrew Brandt. He's the ESPN NFL business analyst, and that segment was brought to you by John Elway Chevrolet. When you go to buy a car, what do you really want? You probably want a lot of cars to choose from. And you want the dealership's best price. Not some starting price or target price. The best price. And you want it immediately, not after hours of negotiating. And you want a salesperson who doesn't get paid more if you spend more. Because, well, you don't want to spend more. Well, you're in luck. John Elway wants all of those things, too. Better yet, John Elway wants you to have all of those things, too. Come see us or click on johnelwaychevrolet.com.